services are worth a lot less after they are rendered than they are before. <laughs> All right. So when, after you Dan, do something. Dan Kennedy, Dan Kennedy used to say it like this. He used to say wealthy people get paid in advance mm -hmm. of the services. So, yes, he, he did, same point. Hey, law firm owners, welcome to the Your Practice Mastered podcast. We're your hosts. I'm MPS. And I'm Richard James. At MPS, we've got uh, one of my favorite people. I get to see him on a regular basis on our Bible and business study uh, oftentimes, and we get to share that part of our world. But also, I've watched him grow his firm throughout the years. And he's from our neck of the woods, right? The northeast part of the country. And so we have a kindred spirit there with Joe Mara today. And we're excited to talk to him about his practice. Joe, thanks for being here. We're excited to have you. Rich, thank you for having me, Michael. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course, it's our pleasure. And Joe, we like to kick things off around here with just a little icebreaker. So to get the audience loosened up a little bit, what's maybe something that not everyone knows about you? Recently elected part-time judge in my town. I'm a gritty small city lawyer and a part-time small town judge. That's nice. my thing. Yeah. So the judge, was that like, did you do it? Cause your firm's successful. Like some people become a judge cause they want to make extra dough and mm -hmm. maybe that was your motivation, but you're doing all right. So what was your motivation behind that? Rich, there were a couple of things. I had a friend that I went to high school with and law school with. And he was my office mate the entire time I was in the Bronx DA's office. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be judge. So he was running for a town judge in one of the other towns in Westchester a number of years ago. And I was on his committee. The first time he ran, he lost. Well, he was running again. And once again, I was on his committee. And unfortunately, he was putting signs up one day on a state route, and he was killed by a drunk driver. Oh, and I don't know, something about him and what he wanted to accomplish helped inspire me to do this. Hmm. And also, I had spoken to some other people who actually served as part-time judges. And they would tell me, number one, the fun they would have. And number two, how they felt it would make them a better lawyer. You know, and I'm starting to see that. I mean, you see things from a different perspective than hmm. when you're on one side of the issue or the other. When you have to sit in the middle gives you a different appreciation. And I've enjoyed it so far. I've already had a couple of, I took the bench January 1st was my swearing in. Mm -hmm. And I've already had a couple of trials, a couple of hearings, and a couple of recusals from people I knew who came before me. Oh. Yeah. It's been fun. And plus, like, here's something you, as a judge, you shouldn't do, but I did it anyway. But I had a guy come before me and I got called on a Sunday by the state trooper. It's like, we have somebody return on a warrant, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I go in, I look at, I get the papers, I look at the guy's name. I'm like, I know that guy's, I know that name. And it's not an overly common name. I look at his rap sheet. It's not, he comes in, see the face. He looks like a lot younger than me. So we go through, he comes in, he's a pop. Sorry, you got called in on a Sunday for me. And he's like, all right, don't worry about it. So we go through the whole formality. Everything's recorded. After that, I said, excuse me. I said, was your grandmother or great grandmother so in a real estate broker in the 50s? He goes, yeah, that was my great grandmother. Jeez, they sold, she sold my parents their first house. Oh, my goodness. This is an, oh, by the way, did you know so and so? She was in grammar school with me and she left in sixth grade, never saw her again. I don't know what happened. He goes, oh. yeah, that's my aunt. This is what she's doing now. And there are like three or four other people like this. And he goes, at the end, he goes, judge because i'll tell them i saw you but I, I definitely won't tell them that how i met you but it, that's something too it's funny it's like i shouldn't have done that why because if he comes out in court what the next sure. time the case is on he says oh aunt so-and-so says hello i gotta explain yeah. the whole thing and recuse yeah, yeah, myself yeah, 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 and yeah, these yeah. people literally i haven't spoken to any of them in 50 years literally right. but it's just one of those weird connections when you live 60 never live more than 60 miles from where you grew up there's always these interactions so oh and it's a very northeast thing not to say that's unfair that's not to say the rest of the world doesn't have this going on for those listening in california that just got aggravated that i put up the east coast but there is this connection on the east coast that just doesn't mm -hmm. happen in a lot of other places. Michael, you grew up, mm -hmm. spent, well, first 10 years of your life in the East Coast. And I think you feel like you're still an East Coaster. You move, you live here now. But I think mm -hmm. even when we moved out in Arizona, I think you would have considered yourself from Pennsylvania. Yeah? 
for sure. And continued the connections from there too. So they run deep. Joe, I'm curious because you've got an, an interesting journey, obviously all the way up to being a judge now as well. But why, why don't you share the high point levels of your journey as an entrepreneurial attorney? I was especially, I was like the Billy Joel angry young man when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And my first, I worked for a guy in law school who actually was Joe Torrey's private attorney when oh, Torrey managed the Mets. Huh. So I used to spend a lot of time. He, we'd go out to lunch. He'd take me to places. And very interesting. One day I'm in study. I'm in law school. He calls me. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm studying. He goes, you could take a night off. I, I, I really got to study. He goes, we're going down to the New York Athletic Club. There's this baseball. He goes, a big baseball event. He says, I'm going to pick you up. All right, get in the car. So the guy's sitting in the car. He looks familiar. Hello. And the guy says, hi, you know, I'm Sal Magley. Now, if you're uh, a baseball fan, <laughs> Sal Magley was a pitcher for the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And his nickname was Sal the Barber because he was a head hunter. He'd throw at people. But he's from Western New York. He had this Midwestern nice way about him. We're talking, you know, and we spent most of the night with the guy. And now we're driving back. And I says, Mr. Magley, I says, my father was a real big New York Giants fan. And he was very, he was very happy when you pitched for the Dodgers. <laughs> and I said, yeah. he goes, what's your dad's name? I said, Joe, the same as mine. He pulls out a picture. He goes, I only got one with me in a Dodger cap. So he writes a little note to my father, hands it to me. Uh, I go home. I say, Bob, guess who I met? Who? So I tell him the story. He goes, he gave me this to give to you. He goes, what the hell would I want this for? He's in a Dodger uniform. And he throws it back <laughs> at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but through Mark, I learned a lot. He it was a small firm and I did a lot for him. Just as a weird thing, I did appeals, appellate briefs. I go take the New York bar exam. Two of the briefs I did were essays on the bar exam. Oh, no kidding. And wow. I'm like, if I screw this up, I'm never going to pass anything. And then I went to work for him and I went to the Bronx DA's office. And I grew up in the North Bronx, right? I think I'm street smart. Cool. First day on the job, right? 7.30 in the morning in August. Parked by Yankee Stadium. So I'm walking up the hill, up 161st Street. And I hear, turn around, this guy is like twitching. What the hell is this? I walk out of the way, let him pass me. He ducks into an alley. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get jumped. Mm -hmm. So I walk out in the street. All of a sudden, stream of urine comes flying out of the alley. Mm -hmm. That was my introduction. Now, I get to the courthouse. I'm in the complaint room that day, which means the cops. The big city, like just to give you an example, in the Bronx in those days in the 80s, we had five courtrooms plus the arraignment part. And they were handling 40, 50 cases a day. And the arraignment part were handling 40, 50 cases a shift. And it ran from 9.30 to 1 in the morning. Hmm. So you can imagine the volume, right? Wow. So I go in. I see this lady sitting there. Her face looks like a tomato with slits. Okay? Uh -huh. I'm like mortified. So I go to my boss. I'm like, Charlie, it's late. I just... Uh, he goes, another husband, wife assault. He goes, I said, Charlie, they're not married. Oh, you know what I mean, common law. Charlie, we don't recognize common law marriage in New York. He goes, come on, Joe. He says, after four months, you're going to be totally immune to this. Hmm. So I interview her, write the whole thing up, right? Two months later, I'm in the part, meaning the courtroom, the case comes up. I see her name come up. And, oh, can I handle that case? Yeah. I go talk to her. Oh, and she looks all nice, all dressed up now, all cleaned up. She said, you know what had happened is this guy she was going out with got drunk, took the refrigerator, put it in front of the door, and terrorized her and the kids for two days until he passed out drunk, at which point they moved the refrigerator away from the door, and she escaped. Now she's like, well, you know, it was my fault. I, I want to drop the charges. Mm -hmm. And Charlie was right. After four months, became immune to that type of thing. So I thought... And one, one more little piece about that, how life is different six miles away from the North Bronx to the South Bronx. I'm sure you've heard of Attica State Prison, right? Yeah. One of the most notorious state prisons in the country. Nasty place, still is. I'm walking by, it's getting close to Thanksgiving. And there's a placard, like a poster in a window of a store. And there's a picture of a bus. And you know what it says on the placard? Reunite your family for the holidays. Bus trips to Attica. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
So that was like a different world. And then I went from that world, my undergraduate degree was in accounting. I was on the bad side of the politics in the office. I was one of the first people to try cases, one of the first people to get a conviction. But because I could write, they stuck me in a motion part, which I hated. I said, I'm out of here. So I go to Deloitte Haskins and Sells, 101st floor, Tower One of the World Trade Center. Hmm. But different type of politics there. And I, bottom line is, I was there for a couple of years. While I was there, I eventually got a second law degree in tax because I figured this is what I'm going to do. And I said, if I do tax the rest of my life, I will commit suicide. So I have to get out of here. So I left, went back to work for the guy, Mark, I worked for in law school. And then after a while, he wasn't paying me enough. And when I tried to bring business in, he was charging too much money. So I opened my own practice, which didn't make him very happy, but that's how I got started. And my family was not, we had one person, one of my cousins who went to, into his father-in-law's oil business, oil, home eating oil. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there were no entrepreneurs. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like when you opened your own practice, did you realize you were opening your own business? No. Or, no. No. Well, just to back up a little bit, I had an offer from a guy who was a childhood. He used to run a shoe store in the South Bronx until he got robbed five times at gunpoint. Then he got up, gave it up and got into the insurance business. And he was by the way, you just, yeah. I just want to stop you for a second, Joe, and just remind you're not doing a very good job for the public relations department of the Bronx. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, this is the Bronx in the 80s and the 60s. It's a little different now. Right? <laughs> but he started selling insurance door to door and he became one of the regional agents for one of the big insurance companies, made a lot of money. And he offered me an opportunity. He said, he was on Long Island. He said, come in. This is what you got to do. I'll give you free office space. We'll refer all of our estate planning clients to you. At that time, I didn't know much about estate planning. Now it's an area of expertise for me. But at that time, no. He goes, but you got to get your Series 7 and you got to sell. And I'm like, sell? I'm not doing that. I'm a lawyer. I'm a professional. I'm not a salesman. Are you kidding? So that's how I went into entrepreneurship with that mindset. Yeah. That I'm not a salesperson, you know? So I didn't realize I was opening a business and I'm not a salesperson. Yes. I'm a lawyer. Are right. you kidding me? Yeah. I'm not a salesperson. Right. Okay. And I learned a lot of, actually what happened is my buddy I went to law school with who was a few years older than me. He'd take some time off in between, was in the Navy, had his own businesses, decided to go back to school. He and his partner had split. And he said to me, come in to my office. I just want to do high-end personal injury cases. I'll refer everything else to you. You just give me okay. a piece of the fee. And he was actually very good to me because initially he didn't take any money at all. <laughs> and he helped me a lot, but also through him and through my old boss, who was Joe Torrey's personal life, I learned a lot of bad things about running a business that I applied. Really, it took a long time. And it, quite frankly, I think when I met you guys, my learning accelerated. I, mean, I already learned from the School of Hard Knocks of a lot of things a lot to do. Right. Well, going through your program and learning through you guys, it's accelerated things. And I feel like I've learned a lot more since. Wish I had something like that earlier. But Well, and by the way, I appreciate the kudos. But at the end of the day, Joe, wherever you get the information from, mm -hmm. you're the one that has to apply it. Mm -hmm. uh, the information is there, right? And mm -hmm. so you're going to be willing mm -hmm. to absorb it and then apply it. And congratulations to you for doing that. Uh, Michael, Absolutely. which is a good transition probably over to your next question. Yeah. So Joe, along the journey, what was that breakthrough moment or that one thing you did that really moved the needle forward and had that light bulb moment for you? Michael, I don't think that's the way it happened with me. It was gradual, little like grains of sand dropping. Learn, pick this up, pick that up. Like I remember when I started, I really had a tough time asking people for money. It was like, oh, God, I, you know, I'm doing this one. I, I, I'm going to get paid for it too, you know? And it really, you know, was tough. And certain people, you don't realize, my father was the kind of guy, he was, he went to World War II, right? Never finished high school, had a drop out of high school during the depression, hmm. worked at a factory in, the, in Manhattan when living in the South Bronx, was dating my mother before World War II, was gone three and a half years, came back at 45, they got married, right? He became a lithographer. He was a union guy. And I told him, I'm thinking of opening my own practice. He said, what are you crazy? You get married next year. I'm like, hey, Pop, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'll be in debt and I'll go back and get a job. That's how I looked at it. Right. But nobody in my family, nobody was around really had any business acumen and knew what to do. 
Yeah, and, so nobody sat down and showed no. you how to ask for money. Michael's a strong man and a great business person, but he had the benefit of hearing me mm -hmm. ask for money literally his whole life. Mm -hmm. Like he's mm -hmm. heard me on sales calls since he was an infant, right? And so that I think there is a real benefit in having grown up in an entrepreneurial family. Oh, but despite that. that, Joe, here you are. So you, so you didn't have that grain of sand moment, or you didn't have that one aha moment. You had a grain of sand moment where it got dripped on you. Mm -hmm. And I suspect talking to the person who's listening to this, who's an attorney just like you, owns mm -hmm. their law firm, maybe still doesn't even realize that they own a business, or maybe have finally figured it out and they're trying to figure out what to do next. Correct me if I'm wrong. One of the reasons why that this was like grains of sand being dropped on you is because in the beginning, you were probably working your tail off just to make ends meet and serve the clients that you did have. There wasn't a heck of a lot of other time left over. Is that an accurate statement? Oh, it most certainly is. And you know, it's funny. I mean, it's funny how things go because a lot of things that I wasn't used to, like my father was the type of guy, he'd get a bill, he'd pay it. That was the way he was. Got something in, it got paid. Right. I thought most people are like that. They're not. <laughs> so you would get people who wouldn't pay their bills at all or would pay them late or would then like, you know, there was something I heard about. I forget where I heard this, but it's good. You ever hear of the hooker principle? Hooker principle. The hooker principle. Okay, I'll bite. That's all right? the hooker principle. Services are worth a lot less after they are rendered than they are before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dan Kennedy used to say it like this. He used to say, wealthy people get paid in advance mm -hmm. of the services. So, yes, he, he same point, mm -hmm. different story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So people would say, oh, well, you didn't do anything. You know, what do you mean I didn't do anything? I got to this result, but it was minimized after the result a lot of times. I've granted the people who are extremely grateful who would pay. But there was enough of them that it caused problems, you know? Yeah. And Well, hey, I remember I was in the funeral business for 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. So if I didn't get paid before the person was in the ground, the likelihood of me being paid went down significantly because what was them, I going to do? Yes. So my standard, unless I'd served your family, my family had served your family for mm -hmm. 50 years, you were paying before the day of the funeral. That was just how it went down because, yeah, you, you, the service is rendered the value of the service becomes worth a lot less after the service has been rendered. I completely agree with that statement. See, the other thing too, when you're starting out, who are you representing? Sometimes you're representing friends and family. Yeah. And that caused problems. Mm -hmm. I remember being at my brother's house with my first wife and before we had kids and they were having a Christmas party. And I was representing one of our cousins. So the one cousin who had a business was representing him and Apparently, his children who were at the party weren't happy with something that I had done. Mm. And I'm down in the basement, and I go up in the kitchen, and there's my two brothers mm. with my two cousins, and I hear them bad-mouthing me. And I'm like, is there something you want to talk about? And they all shut up, and I say, I think I'm going to go. And then I get my brother, one of my brothers, he was a, a cop, and no concept of business at all. How could you try? Well, excuse my language. What am I supposed to do? I got to make a living. I'm doing work for the guy. Come on. But they just that type of stuff. It, oh, yeah, no, yeah. no, that's very, that's extremely nor Northeast United States, Italian family kind of thought process. Well, you, you'll appreciate this being former funeral director. There was a funeral yeah. director in the neighborhood who actually was the sponsor of my brother Ronnie's baseball team when he yeah. was a kid. Uh, Sure. For many years, there was the team picture of my brother when he was 16 in the window of the funeral home. No. So when my mom died and we go there, my other brother, oh, you believe that bastard is charging us this much? And, doesn't he? <laughs> and I'm like, but he's in business. What do you want the guy to do? Because he sponsored Ronnie's team. He's supposed to give you a break? Like, come on. But that's how they thought. And that's where I came from. And that's where I was constantly getting hit with. No, I live that myself in mm -hmm. the funeral business. All right. So, Michael, where do we go from here? So, I'm curious, Joe. Obviously, 
These stories are great, by the way. So thank yeah, you for right. sharing. The, stories, the, the, the point we want to make for entrepreneurs is there. I mean, I want to get to it, but Joe, honestly, I could just keep asking you more questions about family stories and we keep I'm going. just enjoying that. Yeah, I'm just, I feel like I'm a listener right now. Honestly, God, it makes me feel like I'm talking to one of Maria's uncles. Mm-hmm. Like it just because mm-hmm. uh, Maria's grandfather was one of nine brothers and lots of kids in the family mm-hmm. and we would just go to their house and talking to you is exactly what mm-hmm. Christmas dinner was like mm-hmm. every single year. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. I've been in that family since I was 16 years old mm-hmm. and I can't understand how the rest of the world operates because they can't seem to talk all at one time. And there's nothing better than the stories that are being told by you. So thanks for sharing. But Michael, we probably should keep the trains on time. So Yeah. Well, what I'm curious is for the, the law firm owner that's maybe in a similar starting spot or someone that's struggling right now, what is like one tangible, actionable thing that you did to move the needle forward in the firm? Very good question. It took me a long time to hire people and particularly to hire an attorney because I didn't look at it properly. I looked at it, how am I going to pay this salary? How am I going to absorb this extra cost? And that's not the way to look at it. What you're trying to do is leverage that person to generate revenue for you. And it took me a long time to see that. When I hired an attorney, by the way, the first attorney I hired is still with me, by the way, after all these years. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Nice. But when I hired him, like, and it, it took me like three, four years to do it. And I'm like, why didn't I do this two or three years ago? This is crazy. Why didn't I do this? So that was like, if you talk about an aha moment, the most, that was one of the first. Like, this was stupid. Like, if you can leverage somebody else's work, because you're only going to make, you only have so many hours in a day, right? Mm-hmm. You could bill your billable hours. What are you going to do? Work 18 hours. And, and if you're lucky and you look at, this is another statistic. Most lawyers only bill about a third of the time they actually spend at work. Right. So like in the large firms, oh, they're paying them 180000 and $60,000 bonus, but they own them because oh, they sure. have their bill to 2,500 hours a year. Right. And they are there constantly. Yeah. So now you're on your own. How much of you can, you have to run the business, which people don't realize. You have to take care of the administrative stuff. You have to worry about, collect. how much time can you actually spend billing for legal services, yeah. right? You really can't a lot. I mean, granted, if you can right. leverage, for example, you get a big value personal injury case, the per hour return could be huge, but you have to invest years of time, thousands of dollars before you get that return. You got to realize that, hey, I'm only making so much money off my time. I have to be able to utilize other people and utilize them properly. So that is a big lesson, I think, for any business owner to learn, and especially a professional. The other thing is, too, I said, my name's on the door. My name's on anything here. It has to be perfect. That's the way we, I want it done. Mm. So I'd be sitting there moving commas around and period. No, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be good. It has yeah. to be competent. It has to be good. And maybe it's not necessarily the way I would have done it. Just get the good work done. Get it out the door. Those are the, you know, those are I, the two main things. A local business, local name. Fifth, I was fifth generation, family funeral business. I bought my first funeral home from the family when I was 25. And so here I am. And I've told this story privately and publicly before where I was so concerned about every little detail. I got to the point where I was measuring the height of the grass to make sure. Because the grass, the lawn was at eye level the way that the street ran in the old coal miner towns that it was uphill. And so when you'd Mm. walk up the hill, the grass was at your eye level. And it frustrated me when the grass was like this. And so I got the landscaper guy that we had was my cousin. I got him to put a little piece of wood that he would have on a stick to measure to make sure the grass was the (laughs) same height all the way across. That was insane. OCD, like insane that I I was even concerned about that Mm -hmm. little bit of a detail. But I was so ingrained in me about paying attention to, by the way, I still fight this urge today Mm -hmm. to pay attention to that much detail. But yeah, that is the nature of somebody who has, who really wants to control the quality and we're concerned other people can't execute at our level. Mm -hmm. And so we were fearful of hiring. I've got an insightful question that I don't think I actually know the answer to, Joe. So when you started, you said things like small town, New York lawyer, You've done a few things. Did, is it fair to say when you started, you practiced threshold law, like whatever came through the threshold you said yes to, or did you narrow your scope and right away? Like, how no, did that I took a lot of different things. Like for example, of this is a crazy case. A guy got married in Italy 
but he didn't get married in, in front of a Catholic priest. Uh -huh. And I basically did the research because it was a Protestant minister who wasn't authorized by the government. And I got did the research going through Italian law and American law to prove that the marriage wasn't valid. Could you imagine the time I had to spend on this? And I couldn't oh bill God. all of it, obviously. You bill all that time. There's no way. So just I would anything. I had education cases against the New York City Board of Ed, which later I learned more about because I was on the school board of my town for nine years before I became judge. But that time I knew nothing. Like, how do I get this kid? He needs special treatment. How does he get paid? I knew nothing about education law. Right. So right. I took whatever came in. Yeah. And now, okay, so then you hired the associate. And now have you learned to develop more? I know some you can't use the word specialist in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. New York might be one of them. But have you learned to develop specialists or focuses of practice areas that you pay attention to? Absolutely. See, what I do now with the practice, I have one full-time attorney and a part-time attorney who deal primarily with the states. Okay, so I don't handle day-to-day -day things on that. They run things by me. I will look at stuff, but most of the time they're handling it. Right. Mm -hmm. Also with real estate transactions in New York, it's different than other states. I know like some states like Florida, you go to the title company, nobody has a lawyer. Here, everybody has a lawyer. You go to the closing table, you got buyer's attorney, seller's attorney, the yeah. bank attorney, the title company, possibly even the seller's paying off a mortgage, somebody representing their bank to pick up a check, right? You got all these people there. So I now have a paralegal. And one of the attorneys also working on these states, handling most of the real estate. Do I have to be involved to a degree? Yeah, but I hate going to closings. Mm -hmm. Even though I was an accountant for a while, I'm not very good with math. So <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. So, but the things that I still do myself, which eventually I have to get out of and train other people to do. If someone comes in for a will, trust, I do that. So if someone, and it's interesting too, because the techniques that you would use in the 80s for people with a million dollars, literally you can use the same techniques now for people with $20 million. Hmm. So I, I'll do that kind of work. No, the other people, they don't do that. That I still do a lot of myself and sometimes it's a problem. Plus some of the trial work, we had four contested guardianships over the last six months and I tried all those cases and it just wow. burns the crap out of you. So you know. do you see a path forward now to be able to, your firm is successful, you're making profit. Are you seeing a path forward to being able to start saying no or replace yourself in those roles, one or the other? Oh, I, there's already a lot of cases that I don't take anymore. I will tell people, no, we don't handle Like we used to hear, here's an example. I started taking a lot of employment discrimination cases. Okay. And one case I won't mention was an institution of higher learning and the leading ladies were basically getting abused by the supervisor who would say, oh, you want to work this day? Like, come over here, get on your knees type of thing. So I had five of these women and the case hit the papers and you had to go through multiple depositions, multiple to get finally someone, a couple of people to admit. And I had like the attorneys, one of them became a friend later on, attorneys representing the institution come into my office. And at the time it was summer. I had three college kids here. So I said, come here. Cause he's threatening to weigh me down with motions. He right. says, you know what? See these people, they need something to do. File whatever you want. But eventually we settled the case for half a million dollars. Yeah. And I probably would have settled more, but one of the people was a part-time stripper. And nobody knew that. Uh. And I didn't know how that was going to fly. So I said, let me just take the money and get the hell out of here. But even with that, it was so much work with the depositions. And after a couple of more of those cases, I said, I don't want to do these anymore. So I stopped so doing there, those. For the person listening, was there fear in narrowing down to less practice areas rather than taking everything and saying no to some things you don't want to take? Was there fear behind that or was it just learned behavior? No, it wasn't fear. It was learned. It's like, look, I have to leverage my time properly. What do I enjoy doing? What do I know? better than not. And you get to a point in time where you say, yeah, we always like to learn new things, but there's always new things to learn in particular practice areas. The law evolves. Do I have to, like I was doing 15, 20 years ago, learn a whole area of law that I knew nothing about? I don't want to do that anymore. Right. And the areas I don't touch as much, I know everything changes. See, I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough to spot an issue, mm -hmm. but I, I don't want to be digging into 
people already say, oh, you do a lot. I'm like, yeah, I do. But I don't do as much as I used to. And I have the other attorney specializing in various things. So one attorney here, he doesn't, a big part of our revenue is the state estate planning, Medicaid planning, trust. He does none of that. He doesn't know anything about it. So I have him specializing in one area, another attorney specializing in another. But I'm able to supervise them. And unfortunately, like I said, I still am doing too much myself. I have to well, okay, that's good. That. We'll, we'll get into what's next in a second. Michael, where are you going mm. next with this? Mm. What's got you fired up and excited today, Joe? Could be personal, could be business. What's got you excited? What's got me excited? You know, it's what really has me thoughtful is honestly, I look at my life and I'm in my mid 60s now and I'm like, you know what? I've had a pretty damn good life. I mean, there's some problems along the way, but I have a lot of good friends. I still have friends that from literally first grade who I see, you know, I've gotten, I lost, as you know, one of my brothers, but as a result, I've gotten very close to his kids and the grandchildren he never met. And I find myself being more thankful. My first marriage didn't end well, but you met Hannah and she's wonderful. And Absolutely. that's worked out better than I could have imagined. So I look, I say, I'm very fortunate, you know, and I, I appreciate that. And now with this judge thing, it's really been a blast so far, you know, yeah. it's kind of fun. And, you know, I don't like some people that goes to the head. I try to be nice to everybody. I'd be respectful to everybody because you never know when people are going to come around. Right. Mm. So that's really what I feel like. I have my health for the most part. We'll have a little issues we got to maintain. Right. But for the most part, I have my health and things are going pretty well. Yeah. You sound like you're really grateful for where you're at. I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so for that person listening that isn't there. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're grateful for what they have because they can find something to be grateful about, but they don't feel like it's all together and they're struggling. And what's that piece of advice you give them as they're on this journey that you were on, either from small town, big town, doesn't matter. They're going through something mm -hmm. you're going through right now. What's your advice to them? There, there is probably a point, Joe, that you didn't feel the way you feel today. Correct. Right? Yeah. And why am I blanking out? There is a book and there's a guy who wrote the book and I saw him lecture and I'm just blanking out on what his name is, but he started his book. He wrote one generally for entrepreneurs and one for lawyers. Hmm. And he started out his book about the entrepreneur who was, let's say in his example, a baker, someone who's really good baking. Oh, you're talking about Michael Gerber. The Michael e -Myth? Gerber, right. The E-Myth. Yeah. Yeah. And he goes into how the baker couldn't really run the business and kind of life went down the toilet. Mm -hmm. And what I'd say is you have to have balance. You have to set priorities. And if you don't take care of yourself, your business goes down the toilet and then your life goes down the toilet. Mm -hmm. I know too many people who were never around, their spouses didn't want to deal with it and they found other people and their marriages fell apart. So you got to have balance in your life and nothing is worth your health. And because if you don't have that, you can't do, you can't work anyway. So it's like, yeah, I work hard and I, I enjoy working hard. But still, I make sure I take time to do enjoyable things. For example, last week, my two adult kids, right? Three of us went to Park City, Utah. Oh, and we nice. went skiing. Nice. And there's a guy that I met at Deloitte. And this is another quick, funny story. Deloitte, 101st floor, Tower One, One World Trade in the 80s. What was going on in New York in the 80s? The Japanese were buying real estate. Okay. They bring this guy in from California who knew Japanese, right? And he became my office mate. And, you know, we hit it off, nice guy. We'd go out. But every time we'd go out to a bar, he wouldn't order a drink. So one day I'm like, look, man, what's, you got an alcohol problem? What's the issue? He starts laughing. He says, nah, I'm a Mormon. Which, what do we do? And I looked at him. I said, you're engaged, right? And I met his wife. He goes, you guys got engaged. He goes, yeah. I said, guess what? You know what I think too? I bet you haven't gotten laid yet either. Uh <laughs> he turned beet red because I was right. So now, right, what do I do? I said, Brian, man, if you've been down to the village, you know, Greenwich Village, he goes, no, come on, we're going to the village. Guess where I took him? Uh, yeah. S&M stores. Oh, geez. Yeah, but we remained friends. We drifted apart for a while, but it's one of those things we were really tight for a couple of years. He wind up leaving the area. But about six years ago, he calls me up because he had gone to investment bank after he left Deloitte. Come to New York for an investment bank reunion. 
we got to get together. All right. So we did. He came up. We had lunch. Then he met my wife. We had a good grand old time. Since then, I've gone to Park City twice and I've connected with him. That's and great. Great. I mean, we had awesome. such a good time. When you were out there, I hadn't, he hadn't met my kids. So we had dinner with the, the four of us. We had a great time. So that type of stuff, like, you know, I'm fortunate. I mean, a guy like him, two years in my life, he was one of the finest people I've ever met. And we still have a relationship with him. So things like that. You're an easy guy to like, Joe. You know, not uh, but he says yeah. that, Rich. Believe well, it. I know, I, yeah, I know that. I, I, not that I know that because people have said that. I know that because mm -hmm. we're from these. I, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're from where we're from and we don't pull any punches mm -hmm. and not everybody loves that. Yep. But by the way, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, Park City, mm -hmm. a lot better than Hunter Mountain, right? Yeah. So I'm sure you enjoyed yourself mm -hmm. skiing. Yeah. Good. Well, Michael, where are we going from here? Joe, I just want to thank you. Thank you for investing your time on here. Thank you for investing value back into the mm. community. And to the law firm owner listening to this, we appreciate you. Look, if mm. this isn't your first time watch, mm. watching or listening, make sure to give a like down below and mm. hit that subscribe or follow button, depending on where you're listening or watching at. Mm. And show some love to Joe down in the comments. This was a great episode mm. full of lots of awesome stories, funny stories, valuable insights. So, Joe, thank you for being on today. We appreciate you. Oh, yeah. one more. I got to tell you one more quick story. All right. Okay. When Tory was managing the Mets, he bought this a marina by what was Shea Stadium City Field. He bought that marina. Okay. So we had a closing there. And do you guys remember Dave Kingman? No. No, he was a big home run hitter. Okay. He hit, he's not in the Hall of Fame. He hit 460 home runs because really? that's all he could do is hit home runs. Uh -huh. And he was this mm -hmm. big, mean looking guy. But I meet him at this closing, you know, we have a thing, they have a party. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? He's like real, like down third. I'm living on the boat in the marina. Like I'm, it's like totally different than when you see the guy on TV. <laughs> he's a fearsome hitter. And Miller's like, hey, yo, what's going on? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, really nice guy, real sweetheart. Totally yeah. different than the image of what I thought he would be. So. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Joe, you have provided some wonderful entertainment. Yeah. Congratulations on what you've built to this point. Thank you. I'm excited you. to watch what you're going to do going forward as you continue to replace yourself in yeah. strategic areas yeah. in your business and continue to watch your business grow. It's been yeah. an honor to serve with yeah. you as you've been going through this. And thank you to, for thank being you. here today. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. That's the pod.